And next up, we're going to talk about link time optimization, which, uh, d despite your expectation, really does not have anything to do with finding all the Korok seeds uh, in the least amount of time, uh, although I could see why you might think that is the case. Um, if you haven't played Breath of the Wild, this joke makes no sense to you, but it's a good game and you should play it. Okay, um, we're going to talk about uh, some of the uh, mechanics for this uh, and for how we actually do link time optimization. That is to say, uh, optimizations that happen when the program is being linked with its various libraries. Uh, and the biggest challenge for this is scalability, so it actually fits in uh, with our... Uh, discussion of the uh, topics of this course uh, and to give you like a high level overview uh, of interprocedural optimization there is local generation uh, that and that is parallelizable this is we are compiling our code and if you've taken a compilers course you know it's not just quite as straightforward as you know see uh, a line of code and then turn it into assembly instructions what we actually do is take that uh, data and we use it to create an intermediate representation, sometimes referred to as IR. Uh, and that intermediate representation is this is how the compiler thinks about code and this is the level at which the compiler does analysis uh, to actually make a decision about, oh, is this you know, an optimization that we could make uh, or is this something that we want to do or is there something uh, that's preventing that change from happening? Uh, and that happens uh, at the uh, intermediate representation phase. Thing is that because your program could be arbitrarily large, the whole thing needs to be you know, something that the compiler can analyze if it's going to do whole program analysis, in which case there is an incentive for the intermediate representation to be compact, that is, not have too much stuff in it, not be overly verbose. Uh, of course, that is slightly in conflict with the goal of uh, trying to make the best decisions possible, which you can do if you have the most information available. So there is a little trade-off there. Uh, then there is the whole program analysis, which is hard to parallelize, uh, where we create the call graph and make decisions about what transformations are allowed and which are sensible. Uh, and uh, that might be that might be a slow step. Uh, but, you know, it is important uh, if you want to take advantage of these uh, potential economies of scale. It is maybe possible to partition the program into you know, various subunits. That might help uh, in terms of actually uh, making decisions about whether we're going to make an optimization or not uh, at the cost of some accuracy, because we might not be analyzing the whole program. We might only be uh, looking at a particular locale within that program. Uh, and then after we've made decisions about what to do, then there are the actual transformations. So we've decided this is the change we're going to make. And then there is actually carrying out those things uh, in all the places where it's relevant. And that is parallelizable. We're just changing some things. Uh, you know, all, all the decisions have been made, so it's fairly mechanical. And there's no issue with uh, splitting that up amongst various threads. Uh, and so there were a number of what I'll call conceptually uninteresting implementation challenges to be overcome uh, before uh, some compilers like GCC were able to do this kind of interprocedural analysis. Uh, and one of them was having a stable uh, intermediate representation format, right? Uh, if the format can change, it's very hard to make decisions based on the data in it because, oh no, somebody changed it and it broke the interprocedural analysis. That kind of thing is just you know, a question of we need to sit down and agree that we're going to define uh, a format and we're going to uh, have changes to it be controlled. Uh, and that's not interesting, just necessary. Once we've done that, there are a few things that we can actually do as transformations. And they fall into two categories. Um, both of them rely on global decisions, but the question is where do the transformations happen? So. Global decisions and local transformations. This is we've looked over the whole program and now we can make a little tiny change here in this part of the program. So that is devirtualization, dead variable elimination, dead function elimination, um, field reordering, changing how a structure is organized, something like that. Uh, and then there are global decisions with global transformations uh, where we inline something across a couple of modules, uh, where we uh, inline virtual functions where we know that it is safe to do so, uh, where we have constant propagation across various uh, 
uh, procedures uh, from one part of the program to another. So it's not just oh, moving it from function A to function B, but it's you know, in module uh, C and moving to module D. So that will work. Now, interesting issues arise from trying to do this. Uh, and uh, part of the problem is that, well, uh, your program could be really big. Firefox, the Linux kernel, and Chromium all contain you know, tens of millions of lines of code. Um, you know, just keeping all of that uh, in its intermediate representation uh, available to the analysis is going to take a lot of space, take a lot of memory, uh, and it, at least some summary of the code has to be available at, at some time. Um, I mean, loading all of it for you know your whole uh, you know, Chromium engine is really impractical because it's just way too much stuff. So uh, there has to be something that will address how we're going to partition the program, right? We can't keep it all in memory at the same time. Partitioning of some of some level is going to be necessary uh, because if it takes any more than linear time to do this analysis, no one will use it. Um, so, yeah, that's that's basically the problem that we face when doing whole program analysis. For a small program, you know, the kind that you write in an assignment in this course is really not that big a deal because the program is not that big and it can easily all fit in memory and its intermediate representation and there's nothing to worry about. Uh, but when you get to you know, real commercial software uh, with, uh, the, okay, not everyone is as big as Chromium or, uh, or Firefox or anything like that, um, but still, the, the bigger your program, the worse this problem gets. Uh, and how did GCC get better at this? Um, well, I mean, its main strategy is avoiding unnecessary work. Uh, the GCC version 4.5 had the initial version of link time optimization, uh, and they improved on it in 4.6 by uh, parallelization, you know, partitioned the call graph, uh, and you know, put closely related functions together, approximate functions that belong to other segments, so well, we don't have to be as precise about them. Um, and uh, the bottleneck is figuring out all the different types and their declarations. Uh, and then in subsequent versions, uh, versions 4.7 to 4.9, uh, build times were improved, uh, and partly that was by reducing memory usage, by basically not keeping anything in memory that really doesn't have to be, hence chasing unnecessary data away. In modern times, um, GCC does seem to work. If you set the FLTO option, you know, enabling link time optimization, uh, it does work. Uh, and we can see things like constant propagation and function specialization. Uh, I mean, we didn't talk about function specialization, but the name kind of gives a, a pretty good idea is that like, if you know that uh, a particular code path is going to be executed, if the object is of type X, you can skip a whole bunch of uh, details where you say, look, uh, well, if it's of type X, then do this, or if it's of type Y, do that. It can, it can be tedious and have a bunch of branch predictions in it. The compiler can say, actually, for objects of type X, here's the function that runs, uh, and for objects of type Y, here's the function that runs, and so on and so on. A nice thing about LLVM uh, is that it can optimize across different source languages. So even if your whole program is not written in Rust or not written in C++, then they all go to the same intermediate representation. So you can make this work either way. Um, and so um, the compiler and linker can work with both of those in parallel. So if your intention is to uh, slowly transition your uh, software product to Rust, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, you're not harmed by having, say, uh, only one module uh, in Rust. Uh, it doesn't prevent any of the link time optimizations that we talked about. Uh, according to some data that we found, the uh, GCC uh, link time optimization gives about 3-5% to 5 improvement in performance, which compiler experts consider to be good. Uh, you know, it's not world changing, but 5% performance for what is basically free, you know, um, or you know, at the cost of a little bit more compile time, uh, and, and by that I mean you know, actual time spent compiling, we'll take it. 
you know, that's good. The other thing uh, that's nice about it is it allows developers to shift their attention from doing the manual refactoring to uh, having the compiler do it. Uh, and that is, again, a win because uh, if you are spending your time on this, it's not time that you're spending on something else. And if you do manual transformations, there is more of a chance of introducing a bug uh, or other problem. Uh, whereas letting the compiler do it, you have a higher confidence that it is done correctly.